Well, hey everyone, I have an update for you on our They Devoted Themselves video series. We started this last year, last September, as a pilot project to support house organic, simple, missional churches here in our own network, but also across the country, which is why we made them freely available on YouTube. And since we began, we have seen this growing level of enthusiasm I've heard from many of you locally and beyond that have found this to be a meaningful and a helpful resource. I am so pleased by that. All in, it's been really great. And because of this, we now have made the decision to renew the project for the coming year, starting in September. I'm so happy about this. But as we go forward, we need your support. And this means a couple of things. First of all, we need your financial support. We're hoping to add another teacher to the mix in the coming year, maybe someone more kind of youth pastor aged. And between properly compensating our teachers and the supplies that are needed to produce these videos, we've set a budget, a modest budget of $12,000. If you're in simple churches, please just continue to give. We need you to do that. But if you're able to make an additional one-time gift for this, that would also be just wonderful. But additionally, if you're one of the people or one of the communities that are not in our network that are using these resources, I'd ask you to consider helping us to, to, to carry this budget for this year. In the description below, there is a link to give. Please follow it and please support it. And secondly, let me ask you, if you haven't already, to subscribe to the channel and to like the videos every time after watching them. This is just a simple way that we can kind of jerry-rig that YouTube algorithm to help spread the word about these videos, perhaps to other people that are looking for something like this that would be helpful in their own house church or those, those kinds of things. So thank you so much for your support and for giving. Again, the links are down in the description. The teachings are gonna be new through the month of July. August we're going to take off and then we'll launch our new season starting in September. Bless you all. Thanks for your help. As we have seen over the past number of weeks, chapter 13 really begins a long final exchange between Jesus and his disciples. And in chapter 17, this long discourse concludes. It's the dark of night. Jesus is outside of the city walls now, and he stops to pray. Now, first he prays for himself. Then he prays for his disciples. And finally, in the section that we all have just read, he prays for us. He prays for everyone who will believe in him based on the message of the apostles, which is, of course, you and myself. And while Jesus prays for a few things, for us, I think what is unavoidable is this prayerful request that he repeats two times in this short little section that we would be one. He says, my prayer is for all of them, that they would be one. And we look at these words and we sigh and we lament a little bit that this is a prayer that seems to have gone, <laughs> how else do you say it, unfulfilled, unanswered. We see Throughout church history, how the church has fought and splintered and fought and splintered over any number of ethical or theological or sometimes just good old-fashioned relational hang-ups. So what then do we make of these words of Jesus? How do we treat a prayer that at the moment anyways seems quite unfulfilled? Maybe it feels very unfulfilled in your own life. Well, I want to offer you just a couple of thoughts of my own today to feed into your own discussion around this. First of all, and I've been thinking about this for a number of years now, I think we can be sure that Jesus' prayer does not mean that believers would all think the same, never arguing, never fighting, never disagreeing. If that were the case, I think we'd have to admit that the whole kind of unity idea or project was off the rails before it even began. The New Testament is a document that we have that we're reading from that is filled with stories of believers that are not getting along. And the apostles in most of the letters are the apostles writing to these churches, trying to help them to navigate their way through the various challenges that they're experiencing. And so we have to then conclude that either Jesus' prayer was left unanswered right from the very beginning, or that this idea of unity is maybe not exactly what he had in mind that when he prayed this prayer, he had no illusions of a community of followers kind of existing in a perpetual nirvana-like, you know, state of relational bliss, man. 
<laughs> you know, fighting and disagreeing and holding differing views, I think Jesus knew was, you know, part of our story. So if not that kind of unity, then what was it that Jesus had in mind? Well, I think that he meant, and, and this is the second thing I want to highlight for us today, that our oneness should look like the oneness that we see in God. That we would be unified and one like God the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one. Which I'm not saying in this, don't look, flip over the coin and conclude this, that it means that our triune God is like us arguing and bickering in and amongst itself. No, but, but hear what I'm saying in this. Do you notice what it is exactly that Jesus prays? He asks that the Father and the believers may be one. But then he defines what that means. He says, just as you are in me and I am in you. Our oneness then is to reflect the oneness or the unity of God. So then, okay, we, we rightly ask, well, what does the oneness of God look like? Well, it looks exactly like what Jesus has been preaching throughout his final discourse. It looks like what is about to come the next day. It looks like love. God's unity, the unity of the Father, Son, and Spirit is a unity that is built on love for one another but not just any kind of love. It looks like the love that Jesus has been teaching about and demonstrating in his final discourse. It looks like a love that is defined by sacrifice and service and submission and laying down our lives for the sake of the other. I mean, consider again what's already taken place since chapter 13. At the beginning in chapter 13, Jesus begins his final night with his disciples by taking the robes of a servant and washing his disciples' feet. Then he tells them that they need to do the same. He tells them that this is a command and that if they truly know him, they will keep this command. That, that the evidence of their being united in Christ would be their sacrificial love for one another. And then finally, to show the depths of this love, Jesus will willingly lay down his life for his friends, even for his enemies. And this self-deferential love isn't just what Jesus commands of his followers. It's the very love that we see in God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They, they exist eternally in this perfect dance of self-sacrificial love. One of the many places where we see some of this being described is in John chapter 8. Jesus says this when he says, I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. I came, in other words, not of my own choice. I came because God sent me. Jesus, in other words, laid down his life. He submitted in this moment to the will of the Father. And this is what Jesus calls his church into when he prays, may they be one as we are one. He's not asking, I don't think, for oneness of thought or homogeneity of belief on every theological and cultural issue that's out there. He's praying for something deeper, actually. He's praying that we would be one like he and his dad are one. He's praying that we would be rooted in love for one another. A love that sees us lay down our lives for each other like he has for his Father. This is the heart of Jesus' prayer. It's the heart of Christian unity. It's what Jesus was praying for. He, he wasn't praying that we'd all have the same thoughts about every issue. He was praying that we would have a unity that is established in our love for each other. A love that serves and defers and sacrifices even toward our enemies, even toward those in our communities that we strongly disagree with, even towards our Judas, who Jesus is about to call his friend. Now, I, I'm not naive. I, I just turned 47 years old. I've been a pastor for many years. I realize we are in a time of great disparity of thought in our world and and that is present in our churches too. 
And there are times, I would suppose, when the theological or ethical chasm is just too deep to cross, when, when beliefs or ideas are, are too great. I, I understand this reality. But I also believe those times are likely much more rare than what our actions reveal. And in the vast majority of these chasms, what Jesus is praying for is actually what is needed. Persevering, sacrificing, long-suffering love like what is seen in God. And I also understand how hard this is. I mean, as I say, I, I've been pastoring now for a long time, working with groups of people. I get it. Now, there's so much to fight about. Every day we are confronted by people and believers that make our blood boil. Their ideas and positions are vexing and wrenching for us. I get it. The number of letters that I write in my mind to people, <laughs> if you only knew, <sighs> we can't imagine sometimes that we share a pew with these people or a couch as the case may be. <laughs> but we do, right? We really do. And going back to my first point then, the invitation in this call to living unity is not to pretend and play nice. No, we will disagree with each other. But the skill that we need is to do this well, to do this with love, to do this with kindness and sacrifice. And this is the hard work. This is the hard work that love asks of us. So what does this look like in real time when the rubber hits the road? Well, here's some thoughts that I've been thinking about for many months now, even years. Loving like this means that we'll need to learn to be comfortable with hearing different ideas. We'll need to learn to listen with compassionate curiosity to one another. We'll need to accept that some ideas that we hold onto so firmly are not actually as black and white as we think they are. We'll need to accept that we live in a world that's filled with nuance, and that world extends into the church too. We'll need to be charitable to one another. We'll need, as with the meat eaters and the vegetarians that we read about in Romans chapter 14, we'll need to hold on to our convictions while graciously allowing each other to hold on to theirs. We'll need to not unnecessarily provoke. We'll need to learn that there are times when the most important thing we can do is actually to not speak at all. Lord, have mercy on your servant. We'll need to have wisdom to discern what matters are critical and what matters are not. We'll need to learn to give in. We'll need to give ourselves and others permission to change their mind. We'll need to be okay with the idea that people are always in process, always able to be moved along by the Spirit, never finished. We'll need to suffer long and forbear much. And all of these things that I just mentioned here are really just about loving in real time. The laying down your life kind of love that Jesus preached and demonstrated, the love that is in God, and the love that he prayed would be in us too. And I trust that my thoughts have been at least a little helpful for you today. Lord bless you and keep you as you talk together.